Imagine that you live in a place with no government, with no one telling you what to do, a place of absolute freedom. There's no tax, there's no traffic wardens, there's no one saying that you have to go jogging every day or eat five bowls of spinach. It sounds quite good, doesn't it? Or maybe not. Imagine in this land of absolute freedom that you're driving along a road. There are no speed cameras. There's nothing to force you to stop at a red light. There's nothing to stop you driving on the right side of the road. It would be chaos, wouldn't it? You'd probably crash. You might even die. In fact, in this land of absolute freedom, would there be a road at all? Can there be collaboration <coughs> in a land without government? I don't think so, and that is the core idea of my talk today. That without the state, there can be no society. Human beings, in my view, can only live well together against the backdrop of a stable government. Now, to help me make this argument, I'm going to reach back into history to the greatest political philosopher that this country has ever known, Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes was born in Wiltshire in 1588, and he lived through one of the bloodiest episodes in our country's past, the English Revolution of the middle of the 17th century. So he saw at first hand just how horrific life is without an effective government. And he gives the most brilliant analysis ever written of what the state is for, and what I'm going to do now for you is to unfurl that analysis. Now the thing you probably know about Thomas Hobbes is that he is the guy who said that the life of man without the state would be nasty, brutish, and short. By the way, Hobbes always talks about men rather than human beings or women, and that's because he is a sexist pig, but so were they all in that day. Now, Hobbes comes to this conclusion by conducting the same kind of thought experiment that I began my talk with. He imagines what the world would be like without a government, where everyone were equal and free. And he calls this place the state of nature. And he argues that in this state of nature, this land without a government, it would be a state of war. Now, paradoxically, the reason that Hobbes thought that the state of nature would be a state of war is precisely because people are equal and free there. It's precisely because they are free to do whatever they want to do that they can go out and attack people. It's precisely because they're equal to each other that there's no one who can be in absolute control and subdue the rest of them. And Hobbes gives three specific reasons for why it is that the state of nature will be a state of war. The first of these is that of competition. So Hobbes thinks that as human beings, we are naturally competitive. We naturally want the same things. For example, I might want your house, or your lover, or your stapler. And it's because we all want the same things that we're going to start to come into conflict with each other. And then the second reason that Hobbes gives for why the state of nature will be a state of war is that some people are particularly anxious. They have a very timorous disposition. And they're so frightened, for example, of someone coming for their stapler that they lash out in a kind of preemptive strike and the conflict escalates. And the third reason that Hobbes gives for why the state of nature is a state of war is that there are some of us who are what Hobbes calls vainglorious. That's to say, we have a hugely inflated view of our own importance, and we positively like dominating <clears throat> other people. We like power over others. And these are the really dangerous people, the people who, who want to dominate others and therefore ratchet up this war with no end. Now, it's important to see in Hobbes' analysis that he's not saying that people naturally fight each other because they're naturally evil. Many of us want a quiet life. Many of us don't want war. Many of us want to reach out to others. But Hobbes' point is that however well-intentioned most of us might be, 
There is an inexorable logic to human interaction that leads to conflict. Now, if you're thinking that this sounds all a little extreme, Hobbes isn't saying that we're going to be all the time fighting and punching each other and rolling about in the mud wrestling. He, there's going to be hot war, sure. But there's also, Hobbes says, going to be cold war. That's to say that condition of debilitating suspicion and mutual fear, which makes it impossible to do anything else. Hobbes says it's like bad weather. The weather's bad not just when it's raining, but when there are glowering clouds in the sky. And if you're thinking that this sounds a little pessimistic, then Hobbes asks you to look in the mirror. Know yourself, Hobbes says. Nosce te ipsum, in the Latin. When you leave your house, do you lock your doors? Yes, you do. And that is because you cannot trust your fellow human beings not to steal from you. And this is why Hobbes says that we need to quit the state of nature. It is because we cannot trust each other not to attack us that we must all agree to give up our freedom on the condition that everybody else does the same. And that is why we need government to enforce this, to force people to respect each other's freedom, to respect each other's persons and property. So that, for example, I can walk down the street knowing that you're not going to attack me because I know that you don't want the state to put you in jail. It's because I know that you're frightened of what the government might do to you that you don't attack me. And this is what the state is for, to prevent the mutual invasions of the state of nature. Now the state, Hobbes says, can only perform this role if it is extraordinarily, unquestionably powerful. And that is why Hobbes says that the state should be like a leviathan, now, as you probably know, the Leviathan is a mythical sea monster from the <clears throat> Old Testament. And the reason that Hobbes chooses him as a metaphor for the state is because he is seriously scary. So in the book of Job, in the Bible, where he appears, Hobbes says, uh, the Bible rather, says that if you try to attack Leviathan with swords of iron, he just brushes them away as if they were made of straw. If you throw darts at Leviathan, they become, the Bible says, just stubble in his beard. So only if the government has this kind of unquestionably superior power will it be able to frighten even the most uppity amongst us human beings. Human beings don't like what to, to be told what to do. We're proud creatures. We think we know best. And therefore, only a monster can force us to do the right thing. And this, by the way, is another reason why Hobbes chooses Leviathan as a metaphor for the state, because in the Bible, Leviathan is described as king of all the children of pride. And therefore, what Hobbes is doing here is picking up on a very old tradition in the history of political thought, according to which what politics is for is to tame the self-importance of men. St. Augustine put it that what Rome was for was to act as a kind of lid on the libido dominandi, the will to power of human beings. Now this might strike you, as indeed it strikes me, I should say, as pretty appalling, in the sense that it looks like Hobbes has just given us a recipe for the kind of totalitarian government that we've seen reach such horror in the last hundred years. And it is true that the great flaw in Hobbes's theory is that he does not put any checks on the state. So it's all very well setting up a monster to protect us from the attacks of our fellow human beings. But what happens when the monster turns on you? As John Locke, Hobbes' great critic, said, what Hobbes has done is to free us from polecats and foxes only to lead us into the lion's den. But we mustn't let our outrage at this part of Hobbes's theory blind us to what he gets right. While we do not want to let him take us to the edge of his authoritarian abyss, nonetheless, 
Hobbes identifies two truths that seem to me to pick up on the truths of social and political life. The first is that if the state is going to be effective, if it is going to protect us, it has to have a monopoly of force. And that is what Hobbes saw clearly for the first time. And the second thing is that if we want the state to protect us, if we want to be safe, we have to give up some of our freedom. And of course, that has become the mantra of modern times. There has to be a trade-off, we hear, between liberty on the one hand and security on the other. Now, of course, we might argue about where we want to draw the line between those two things, and we might argue that the United States of America has gone too far with its recent policy of surveillance over all its citizens. But nonetheless, Hobbes's general point still holds. If you want to be safe, you have to give up some of your liberty. And of course, Hobbes's point is that we're not free at all without government. Without government to protect you, you'll be frightened and distrustful at best and dead at worst. And this is Hobbes's genius. It may, he makes us rethink our attitude to government. Most of us hate government. We hate being told what to do. We hate to feel the long fingers of the state meddling in our affairs. But that is precisely because we're looking at it from the extremely privileged vantage point of peace. And the peace is the thing that we only have because of the state. Hobbes, on the other hand, is writing from the vantage point of war. And we ought, therefore, to listen to his testimony. He bears witness to the peculiar pain of what happens when brother lines up against brother on the battlefield. And he knows that government, however much we might dislike it, if it's keeping us safe, is better than no government at all. It is not the most palatable of lessons, but it is surely one that has great resonance in our day. What Hobbes shows us is that the state not only frees us from fear of our fellow human beings so that we can sleep well in our beds at night, but that it also carves out a safe space in which we're able to scale the heights of human possibility. To paint, if that's what we want to do. To build schools. To have a party. To be whoever it is that we want to be. And finally, the state gives us the confidence to reach out to other people in friendship and collaboration. None of this would be possible without the peace that the state brings. And this is what Hobbes says in the most famous passage that he ever wrote and with which I'll conclude my talk. <clears throat> without the state, Hobbes says, you'll find yourself in a time of war where every man is enemy to every man. In such a condition, Hobbes writes, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Thank you very much.